It's Thursday, it's 12.15 and we're live in Westminster. Please welcome Keir Starmer, leader of the Labour Party. Keir Starmer sets out the first steps he would take if Labour wins the election. Here we are. One card, six steps. In your hand, a plan to change the country. And who will be the Labour candidate in Jeremy Corbyn's North London seat? Today, we have taken decisive action to reduce legal migration with our five-point plan. Enough is enough. That was six months ago. Is that pledge going to be delivered? The government publishes its guidance on how schools in England should approach sex education. When we did the review, there were lots of teachers and head teachers saying more clarity is required here in terms of age appropriateness. So we've responded to that. Joining me to discuss all that, Labour MP and front bencher Dame Angela Eagle, Conservative peer and former minister James Bethel, Lucy Harris, director of the Growth Commission think tank and a former Brexit party MEP, and author and journalist Owen Jones. This is Politics Live. Let's start with this story in the Financial Times. The headline says Berlin explores tax breaks to get Germans working longer hours. It's reported to be part of the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz's growth plan that aims to make working longer hours more rewarding. Should we encourage people to work longer to grow the economy here, Angela? Well, I, I think um, you have to look at what the German Chancellor is doing in the context of the German economy. And you have to remember to begin with that um, working hours in Germany are far less um, they, uh, than we, we work some of the longest hours in Europe. But not and very so, productively. Well, well, that's a, that's a slightly different issue. It's, that, that's, about, that's about investment and, and machinery and plant and, and, and having new innovation. But I think at the margins... If you've got more hours that you can work, you can get some more productivity uh, by encouraging people to work longer there. But if there's more work to be done, you need to create new jobs and make sure that you equip uh, people to do those jobs with the right skills and training. So it may be something that's appropriate in Germany. Uh, and it's certainly the case that if you look at, uh, at, at any economy, reforming the labour market to right. give a better deal yeah. for workers, which is what the Labour Party is going to do, is the way that you can improve productivity. All right. In principle, what do you think of the idea? Of course, the German economy isn't the same as the UK economy, but this idea of giving tax breaks uh, to people to encourage them to work longer hours. It's a good idea. I mean, if you want to make more money, you need to work longer and harder. We've got a massive productivity problem in this country. 280,000 people have dropped out of the workforce altogether due to poor health. And that's costing us £60 billion a year that we can't afford. If we don't find more people to put in full week's work, then we're not going to be able to afford the country we live in at the moment. We'll maybe deal with NHS waiting lists then. I don't think it's just about waiting lists. I think it's also about the environment in which we live in, which is not encouraging good health. I think it's not giving people the power and the choices to lead healthy lives. Uh, and I think it's also a bit about some personal decisions about people trying to commit themselves to looking after themselves. It's a complicated matter, but you are right yeah, that health is at the centre of it. Uh, Lucy, you're the director of the Growth Commission that was set up by Liz Truss, the mm -hmm. yes. former Conservative Prime Minister. What do you think of this yeah. as an idea to get people, Germans, working longer hours, to give them tax breaks? Yeah, well, I mean, we've... we've uh said in our most recent growth budget that we should be doing tax breaks. And it's not necessarily uh, a more general thing. We do have a, a mix of different taxes like unfreezing, uh, unfreezing tax allowances, but we've also got abolishing inheritance tax, which we want to focus on retired people who we want to get back into the workplace because we think that they would increase growth in the economy. So it's about incentivizing different sections of society to get back to work. And like James said, it's also about accounting for those who are sick as well. Owen. We've got Liz Truss's crew here to recommend how we uh, put growth in the economy. That <coughs> went, went a treat last time. I think everyone looking at their soaring mortgages and rents can remember how those ideas went. In Germany, they've got a problem of in, underinvestment. Part of the problem is um, Angela Merkel pushed for a debt break, which prevents them investing in their economy. So then they shift on to so, so blaming this, workers instead. And, well, and, is this a better idea then? Well, no. I mean, if you look at this country, um, each year, the TUC, Trade Union Congress, they do an estimate of how much 
unpaid overtime workers do. It's worth about £30 billion pounds a year. Um, so people are already overworked. The word productivity is quite useful to mislead people because it makes people think it's how much workers are putting in. But actually, that's not the proper definition of well, no, productivity. It's about produ being productive. Well, if, you look at, if you look at Britain since 2010, we've had a productivity crisis since uh, this guy, Lord Bethel's crew, have been in power, oh. which has massively accelerated. That's not because workers started slacking when they came to power. And um, for a start, I mean, it's quite interesting, uh, Rishi Sunak critiques the cuts to corporation tax because he said what happened is companies got all the extra money and sat on it rather than investing it in those companies. And that's an example. You modernise companies, you invest in new machinery, in new technology. Companies have failed to do that in this country. So I, I think the problem right. isn't overworked workers, it's investment, and that's a and price of a private and training. public investment. And skills training well, as me, well. Let James that, come that back. Go with it. Get you. Absolutely. Uh, skills are very important. But listen, we've got a problem that a lot of people are <coughs> leaving the workforce altogether mm. in their 50s, 60s, at a time when people are also living longer. That is just unsustainable if we're going to keep uh, paying our bills as a country. We've got to keep people in the workforce for a longer period in their life. And by the way, people live longer if they are working. It is good for people for their mental health, for their physical health, for their sense of mission. If they're in good work. work. And and they're they're in if their, work. If their health is good enough, then they should be um, encouraged to work. So I think the idea of tax breaks for people, either later in life or for their overtime, are the kinds of sensible measures we should be taking. Right, more, encouraging more people back into the workforce, what's wrong with that in general? Well, I mean, it, it depends on, 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 on the people we're talking about. There are people with ill health when it isn't appropriate to send them back into the workplace. And I think that's my fear with the government's policy. And do you think there are some who perhaps could be encouraged back to work and actually if be off? Well, we don't have a functioning it. national health service in this country, so we have lots of people with health conditions who aren't being properly supported and treated. And that's the problem with, with what they've done there. Just quickly, though, if yeah. you increase uh, the amount of time people work, that hits working class people more because the poorer you are, the less you live and the less your healthier life is. Um, and the That's second point true, is, I mean, the, if you look at the four-day week, if you look at the... Have a conversation, don't yeah. shout. If you look at the promotion of the four-day week, um, which actually Germany in, in place have been trialling, that finds actually productivity goes up often when you incre decrease people's working hours, they do more, and actually their well-being well, is improved. I, I think very, it's also about brief. the quality of work. At the moment, we've got a lot of people who have fragmented contracts who are working and yet all the hours because that they can ban and still not earning contract. enough money to get out of poverty. So it's about quality of work and being able to uh, improve your prospects by working as well. Just finally, Lucy, before we move on then. Did you want to um, say well, yeah, I think we should also be looking at public sector productivity as well, and that's a significant issue in this country. And it means that from our overspend, I think it was £192 billion that this country has spent on civil servants with a lower 6.7% of productivity in the last year, means since COVID, uh, it means that we need to find a different way of managing how we do things on the public sector as well. Um, Although it did expand, of course, under COVID during the pandemic. And um, how we can do that is or, freezing budgets, which would allow well, for a lot of these tax breaks. Let's look at uh, some of the suggestions from Labour, from the Labour leader, because there's been a big launch today uh, with the party talking about its core messages ahead of an upcoming general election campaign. It was at an event in Essex and Sir Keir Starmer set out what he describes as his first steps for government. Let's have a look at how the papers have been covering it. The Times. Starmer sets out to woo voters with six pledges. It does say underneath no new policies but a vow to control Orders. And then the mirror. Uh, Keir to mirror readers. You can see there uh, the six steps. My six fixes for Britain. Well, let's show you how Labour have uh, demonstrated those six steps. There we are. Deliver economic stability, cut NHS waiting times, launch a new border security command, set up Great British Energy, crack down on antisocial behaviour and recruit 6,500 new teachers. And there is Keir Starmer with his sleeves rolled up and ready to go. <laughs> uh, let's uh, take a listen to some of his speech. This is a message that we can take to every doorstep across the country. Every doorstep across the country. And make that argument. Decline is not inevitable. Politics can make a difference. Britain will have a better future. And you can choose it with Labour. Stop the chaos with Labour. Turn the page with Labour. Return politics to service with Labour. 
And with patience, with determination, with these first steps, we can rebuild our country with Labour. Angela, will Labour change everyday people's lives? Yes, I mean, that's the whole point of the Labour Party being created. And these are the first steps, illustrative steps, which will make a real difference in uh, in day-to-day -day people's experience of the way our country works. So, for example, get a cut NHS waiting lists. We've said 40,000 uh, more uh, appointments in the NHS each week. Uh, that will mean that we can start tackling some of the things that we were talking about uh, with people waiting with long-term conditions to get treatment. All right. Uh, for example, cracking down on antisocial behaviour, recruiting six and a half thousand no, more sure. teachers. We know, we know what they say. We know what they say. Will, people. but will it really amount to fundamental change? Um, do you think it will? Will Labour change people's lives? Well, I don't know, but I am disappointed by the vapid nature of these pledges. Take the health pledge, reducing waiting lists. A Angela is just um, not right to think that those GP appointments are going to make any dent on waiting lists at all. And that's a meaningless commitment if it's not supported by a comprehensive public health programme. He says first is, step. These are first steps. Yes, yes, of course. But it's, it's, the, it's, it, that's an outcome. You, you get a reduction in the waiting list once you've addressed a load of quite complicated matters. Mm. And well, therefore, presenting this as though it was a click of the fingers, snappy thing that they're going to do in the first few days gives me the feeling that this agenda is being run by pollsters rather than by the, thoughtful Angela, politicians. I mean, th these are illustrative of the missions that uh, Keir Starmer set out, which he is talking about um, taking 10 years to... Uh, bring into so effect. Two terms, there, there, is, there is absolutely uh, no view that you can wave a magic wand and everything's going to be hunky dory. But what we have to do is get away from 14 years of chaos and incompetence with the Conservative Party, a party that's more interested in changing the Prime Minister than changing the country, obsessed with its own internal politics, but and have that, some is, yeah, coherent, no, but is that competent the problem? government Is that the problem, Andrew? Problems. You're relying too much on people having fallen out of love if they ever were in love with the Conservatives, rather than setting out something that looks like it will deliver well, the change a, that you a, set out. There'll be a manifesto. The, these pledges are the first steps. They're not the entirety of the manifesto, and they're illustrative of the changes that we'll make in issues that really people care about. So setting up GB Energy, for example, to ensure that we can have more security in our energy system, that it'll be clean, that we can keep prices down, that would make a real change to every person up and I down this country. I think that we are deluding ourselves to think that anything is going to change necessarily because the issues are still, are still the same. We still have planning problems that are still the same, which means we don't have cheaper energy because we can't build. We still have housing issues because yeah, we can't build. Yeah, we're going build. to reform the planning system and we're going to build more houses. What are you going to do? We are going to reform the planning system so that we get... The, <laughs> well, we, we're not going to have... <laughs> we are not going to have a load of nimby backbenchers mm -hmm. who go ah, behind their back into okay. Downing Street and stop change happening. Ah. We are going <laughs> to get house building working in this country. We're going to ensure that we deal with some of the shortages of basic... Uh, well, things like houses and the right place to live. Well, we'll come back. We'll come back to your number. But Lucy, are you saying that none of this day. is going to make any difference? The system overall needs to be completely reviewed. But this right. is, I mean, we but have but judicial, that's what we have judicial. Trust. Trust. Yeah, well, I was going to say that is what Liz Trust. We have judicial reviews which prevent planning, planning applications, and they prevent um, you know big big in energy structures that we need to be built. We have many different areas within planning that prevent environmental things from happening, say wind farms, solar farms, anything that you might like or uh, would like to the see with these five pledges. On, solar power on land right. for years. Let me bring in Owen, um, because Owen, looking at this, could be you know the first Labour government being elected since 2005. Is this going to deliver change? No. Firstly, there's a question of trust. There's a reason he's not calling these pledges, because that would remind everyone of the pledges he made when he became leader of the Labour Party. Public ownership of utilities, taxing the rich in order to invest, scrapping tuition fees, ending private sector... But he's done that already. The NHS. He, he's done that already. So you're saying people won't trust... Yeah, I'm, I'm, say, I'm, I'm, I'm saying if, if a politician with that record mm. of dishonesty... Uh, U-turning, I mean, again, £28 billion a year clean, a clean mm. investment mm. fund, uh, that he scrapped as well. But the other point is, this doesn't even scratch the surface. Take the pledge he's made on teachers. That account, that amounts to every school in the country getting 0.2 new teachers. 
a 2% rise in NHS appointments. The problem with what Labour's done is they've firstly backed a fiscal rule, uh, which they have taken from the Conservatives, which means they can't have new investment, um, backed by the fact they won't increase taxes on those who are booming like never before. So they can't invest in these public services. The other point is, and this is, I think, gets to the core, you, Angela mentioned why the Labour Party was founded, and it was founded in order to represent working people and those who are struggling. Um, new Labour, for all my problems with New Labour, which we could have a whole programme on, uh, they had an anti-poverty measure, a flagship anti-poverty measure, the minimum wage. This Labour Party has not a single anti-poverty measure. And if it gets by worse, way, it gets the worse way, than that. Owen, they support the two-child benefit Owen, cap, yeah. Owen, which well, drives children Owen, into poverty. The minimum wage wasn't in uh, New Labour's five pledges, but we did it when we were in government. These are steps that we're going to take. They're not the entirety of the programme. And if you don't think that Labour is going to make a difference and you're anti-conservative, then what are you actually saying about what should happen well, at the next election? That you're happy to keep the Conservatives in power? No, and, 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 because the choice will be between a Conservative government and a Labour government. I, I think for the first point I'll make is the minimum wage... That was Labour policy years before the 1997 election. It's not true they unveiled that in 1997. Owen, it was policy for years. answer that question about what you want to happen. The, well, the, the, Labour's going to win the next election. By uh, that. Hold, hold on, uh, hold on, Angela. Uh, hi. Uh, can, I, can I answer this? The Conservatives <laughs> have trashed themselves and they've destroyed themselves so as a party government. So you think it's government. safe to Absolutely. criticise the Labour because Party? Because the, pro they're going the problem to at the moment is all well, the well, pressure in politics is coming from those who think we should blame migrants for all our problems, that we should cut taxes on the rich, and we need pressure on the Labour Party from those who think we need to increase taxes on the well-off, which Keir Starmer promised then reneged would, on, I investing would, in mean, public services. To be honest, Owen, I'd welcome pressure on the Labour Party when we're in government, but I think that you've rather um, taken for granted the next win. Remember that Jeremy Corbyn left us with the worst election result we've had since 1935. I have had to spend the last few years sat in the House of Commons at the beginning of the Parliament, it's less so now, there were 164 more Conservative MPs than there were Labour MPs. And we have got a mountain to climb to win the next election. Polls are looking good, mm. yeah. but and we've Angela, got to deliver know, the deal. So know, I just would be that very happy, Owen, mm -hmm. for you to put pressure on the Labour government when we've got one, but you mustn't assume we're going to get one if you go around this saying is, our leader is, is dishonest. This is absolutely <laughs> hilarious. The idea oh. that you should abandon pressure when you have leverage. The fact is... What well, leverage have you got, pressure, Owen? You've left the Labour I'm just, Party. Well, because I can argue for people to vote oh. elsewhere but why did you in mean? order to put pressure on the Labour Party to actually stand up for the things that Keir Starmer originally promised in the first place. But uh, I'll come to that, actually, in a minute. Owen has a point, though, on increasing taxes. Owen has many points. Uh, he does. <laughs> Thank you, on, Angela. I'm glad what, finally we have too many Owen, Owen, Wisdom <laughs> emerges on the panel. The issue of trust and Keir Starmer dropping and changing policies, um, policies that could fund the sorts of transformational change that many people within Labour would like to see. So increasing I don't, taxes, I don't think, borrowing to I don't invest think he has way dropped. beyond. I don't think he has dropped oh, promises. Well, he has dropped I think, those two. Look, I think, he, first of all, he's not an ideologue, he's a practitioner. Pragmatist. And when he made the pledges that Owen was talking about, that was pre-pandemic, pre-war in Europe, pre a range of issues. So you have to have uh, pledges yeah. and uh, first steps, you whatever you want to call them. The, f a the top 5 of hang on, a manifesto. You have to drop. You have to create a manifesto that's for the times we're in now, not for the times that were happening uh, in 2019, especially this after is we not, had... This is, can I, I have to answer this? I have to answer this, because this is well, illustrative. Well, I'm finished, yeah. But it's illustrative <laughs> of how dishonesty is contagious in politics. Oh. Keir Starmer... Cheers. I'll Thanks, well, it's true. Owen. This is true. No, Keir, there's a difference between I'm being the, an ideologue Keir, okay, okay, and Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. When Keir Starmer was standing to be leader of the Labour Party, he told your former colleague, Andrew Neil that nationalisation of all the utilities Ooh. was going to be the next manifesto. He then told Laura Kunisberg two years later that he had never supported nationalisation. Now, if Boris Johnson had done something similar, you would quite correctly uh, be okay. denouncing him for dishonesty. Right, well, You're not, not because he's your guy. We're going to take rail into public ownership. We're looking at what to do with some of the other failing utilities as well. I think you should have a little bit more optimism about what Labour what, government so is doing. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Let me pick up, up something else, Owen. Uh, 
Uh, said, which is that Labour are going to win the next election. They're going to win it and they're going to win it big. Yeah. Whether it's as big, yes, he says. Whether it's going to be, and then he's left the party. Uh, whether well, it's that, going yeah. to be, as, whether, whether, well, I'll come back he's to that. He's left the minute. party so you um, can tell people I'm, not to vote Labour. Do you agree? I, I don't completely agree. Listen, I can see the polls as everyone else can. Yeah. I go out and about. You, I can, you can tell what the mood in the nation is. But I was also working at the Sunday Times in 1992, and it felt very much like then. It felt like a slam dunk for, for Labour. And then suddenly it all slightly went different. And there was a question of trust. Uh, Kinnock came across badly, and then the nation slightly thought that maybe John Major had a point. You're kind of getting that on uh, Sunak a bit. Are you? Well, today's migration figures are going to make a lot of people think maybe he's got a point. All right. Well, let's have a look. Yes, Lisa, I'm going to ask you to comment on this. Labour's first steps for change. We've gone through them all, but let's focus on the economic one. Um, Deliver economic stability with tough spending rules so we can grow our economy and keep taxes, inflation and mortgages as low as possible. Can you sign up to that? So, well, I want to know what I'm actually signing up to for once because I haven't actually seen what that economic stability and the spending rules he's talking about. As far as I'm concerned, you would have to start to freeze budgets to be able to afford any fiscal headroom for anything that he's suggesting that he would like to spend his money on. We already know but that they've the dropped 28 billion. We've already, we already know they've dropped the 28 billion pledge to their, their green programme because they can't afford it. And they are in the similar situation to the Conservative Party. Um, there is, there, the, where we're going to get the money from is questionable. We can't, you know, print more money because we'll end up in further inflationary situation and we can't increase our debt. So where does he go? And I think that's the current question that he's grappling with and the Labour Party are grappling with. And I, I, I suppose in a similar sense, the Conservative, the Conservative Party is also grappling with. I mean, with. obviously they're learning the lesson to some extent mm -hmm. of what happened under Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng and the mini budget with £45 billion pounds worth of unfunded tax cuts. You can't do these things yeah. out of thin air because markets uh -huh. yeah. crash and our currency. I think you need to project into the future and that's precisely what well. we do at the Growth, budget, uh, the, the Growth Commission. We look at certain policies and through our modelling we can see what the policy will have an effect on GDP per capita from 10, 20 years into the future. And that's how we can start to look at what is possible and what is viable when we're looking at budgets and when we're looking well, at economic Well, with economic plans. modelling, it depends on the economic assumptions mm -hmm. that you've written into the model. And I presume it'll be a neoliberal economic assumption that you have to cut uh, the public sector as much as possible, which is what you've been talking about. Uh, and somehow that uh, if you give people tax cuts, growth will automatically... Mm -hmm. But we're struggling um, you're talking about out of the model. That is we, precisely we can certainly what give Liz Truss decided to do. If, if and look... We can how certainly give that you a rundown out. and let you know how it's put together. The model that we actually run takes into a lot of different things into account. We actually measure regulation, which is the biggest issue we currently have in this country in terms of how we grow the economy. We did a budget and we worked out that we would grow the economy by 2044 by 6.4% if we got our planning rules correct. And why should people trust what you have done? Well, I think, it, I think it's looking at how our modelling works. Our modelling is, um, you know, we've written it with a collection of 13 commissioners and economists from across the world. We have Probably multiple ones in... All we have in, the same ideological well, bent, you, you, I expect. I mean, if, I mean, some of them have different opinions, and that's why we are a commission. We have different opinions feeding into the commission. We've recently uh, produced a report by uh, Naohiro Yashiro, which is a Japanese commissioner who's written about the demographic changes in the West and what we can do. It does have some, uh, some uh, policies that you might sign up to, Angela, oh. getting women back into work um, and, you know, incentivizing women who you have, have to, been... If, if you're who getting have women back into, into work, back into you work. have to facilitate them getting back oh, into work by that's having your job. All right, let's go back. child care and that is oh. by the way public expenditure mm -hmm. which you're against let me just show you this uh, headline jeremy corbyn labor to select candidate for islington north seat um, this has been a bit of a saga uh, with jeremy corbyn uh, the former leader of the labor party sitting as an independent wants to stand again as a labor candidate in the seat that he has represented for quite some time uh, will he be able to do that angela no no um would you persuade him to still stand for the Labour Party, bearing in mind you've cancelled your membership well, of the party? No, he should, of course he should. He should he, his local party wants him to be their candidate. Right. They nearly unanimously voted for him to be their candidate. Yeah. The Labour leadership is banning them from allowing him to be the candidate for but, the party. But you think? But you, you've said the Labour Party is in my blood. Here's why I've just cancelled my membership. 
wouldn't he also have greater leverage outside of the party as yeah, an Yeah, I agree. That's why right. you have, that's so why stand encourage... as an independent. Oh, right, as an independent. No, you're no, not he, encouraging he, to stand he, as a Labour He absolutely candidate. will stand as an independent. Look, Keir Starmer, when he ran for leader, said that any local parties must have the right to choose their own candidates. Another example of his pledges burned to death. This is a, this is a Labour Party now which is for Natty Elphick. She's one of the most right-wing Conservative MPs. She intervened to help her sexual predator husband. That's the Labour Party today. A woman who stood up right. over and over again, well, fine, bashed fine. migrants, we've done, we've bashed done But let me put that... But on, uh, but on, on this point about fight, the point about why I left, I think you keep oh, bringing yes, it up and yes, they're just dismissing yes, it yeah. about talking about... No, me, no, I don't dismiss it. it's all very funny it. and all the rest of it. The point is, at the moment... If you believe in things like taxing the rich in order to invest, if you believe in opposing war crimes, Labour thinks that, that you'll just vote for them, whatever. They don't need to listen to you and they don't need to cater any of their policies to, for you. But Labour have to fight for those votes. My view is Labour will come to power because of their dishonesty and because of their failure to have answers to the country's problems, they will be a burning skip. All right. fact, they will fall so apart and then the talking... far right will fill the vacuum. And I want, I want the left, people who believe in things like taxing the rich to invest in our collapsing public services <laughs> to fill that void yeah, instead. Yeah, but hang on. I mean, you've just said you're pretty sure Labour are going to win the election, right, come, come what may. Um, do you think Keir Starmer's the most right-wing Labour leader, then, in recent history? Yes, actually, because if I look back again to take new Labour back in 1997, mm. uh, again, before 1997, before that election, they had an anti-poverty measure, new, uh, the minimum wage. Keir Starmer backs a two-child benefit cap, which yeah. now puts into the right of Suella Braverman, yeah. which plunges... Hundreds, it imposes the evil, the yeah. social evil of poverty on little children. And that devastates their lives and it devastates their future and it devastates okay. the right. country well, as well. That. He's um, more that right. is pro-poverty. It's ridiculous. I, I, more right wing than Tony Blair. No, listen, I mean, the, the thing is that we have to persuade the country that we can uh, come into government and uh, run things properly. And we have to, therefore, we're held to a higher standard than the Conservatives. We have to cost the uh, programme that we're uh, going to run the country with. And we are always under far more scrutiny than anybody else. So if kids in are... poverty should pay the price? Hang on, hang on, hang on. No. Let her finish. Well, what are you um, going to do to lift them out of poverty? Oh, you no, support Owen, driving children Owen, into poverty. Shouty across the table. Oh. You know, she let, let, her, let her answer. If you look at our record in government, you will see that we cut child poverty when we were last in government, and I am convinced we will do it again. How? We have values. How? Listen, Owen, I don't I, have Values to... don't pay the bills. But values don't drag Owen, children Owen, out of poverty. I will come what, back what, to you, what, but what let her finish her point. Uh, we have a proud record of uh, establishing uh, organisations like the health service, strengthening uh, the social security system, making our society better. Whenever Labour governments come into government, that is what they do. They help those that need help the most, including getting children out of poverty. We have a very proud record, when I was last in government, of doing precisely that. But the if Owen is going to be that negative, that's up to him. But I believe that at the end of a period of Labour government, child poverty will be down, opportunities for ordinary people All will right. be greater, and we'll have a better, more balanced growth but you than don't... we have had with uh, 14 years of failing, chaotic, well, there's a commitment. incompetent, conservative. There government. is a commitment. There is another difference, Owen, that the economy was in a more benign state uh, when Labour took over in 1997 mm. um, than now, which I think you would uh, agree broadly. But do you trust what Angela says? Well, Coming back to your issue, that you don't think Keir Starmer has been trustworthy. Do you trust that it, it should It is ordered? absurd to say that we will lift kids out of poverty because look what we did in the past. I mean, she actually mentioned there the alluded to the 1945 Labour government, which did introduce the National Health Service when the country had literally been bombed to rubble by the Nazis. Exactly. That's and, why yeah, we'll do you, yeah, better you, than your... Yeah, no, no, rather, no, Angela, Angela your with, all due, with all due respect... Don't talk is with all due respect, Keir Starmer is not Clement Attlee and... The, the Labour have, have literally, with the fiscal rule they have, meant that they cannot invest in these services. The point about kids in poverty is a crucial one. It's, it should be the core of what the Labour Party is about, OK? Kids in poverty. Yeah. And, and if, you, if you support the two-child benefit cap, then you support driving kids, hundreds of thousands of them, into poverty. Well, hang now, on. It, let's you, see what the you need to say. You can't might... say look at our past yeah, record. On, you have to say how you're going to lift kids what's out of poverty. Conservatives, do you not care about this sort of stuff? I, I care about it greatly. But what I'm most struck by this discussion is that today, Keir Starmer is trying to project the idea that he, he's a solid uh, proposition for the electorate. 
But this discussion is showing how divided Labour really he's is. Not he's not in the Labour party. party. Not he's not in the Labour he's party. party. He's not my problem he represents... He's not in the Labour party. All right. he represents you must views. know the difference between he Owen Jones views. and the Labour party. He represents views, Andrew, that are very, very strong no, in no, your party. No. Oh, yeah, and this discussion, think he's in the this discussion I think that has they alluded do. to... Of course they do, but... That has alluded to look, foreign affairs. Look at your record. Look at your record. has alluded to foreign affairs. You ended start. You've driven millions of people. I said to Owen not to talk over you. Don't talk. Over James. I, I, I think that the idea that Keir Starmer is not going to have turmoil on his benches is for the fairies. And you asked me whether I thought that it was a slam dunk for Labour in the next election. No, I think the electorate are going to Excuse wake up me, to this very problem. To make, are you actually trying to say that the Conservatives haven't had turmoil on their benches? Yeah. We've had four prime ministers in the last three years. All right, Andrew, just what briefly, because we're going, to, we're going to move on. We're going to move on. But are you disappointed he's left the party, Owen Jones? I'm always disappointed right. when everybody leaves the party. And, and are I you love worried Owen. I wish worried? he was in the party, oh, but he's no. not. Oh, well, oh, no, uh, that was it. That was the question oh. to Angela, not for you to respond, um, because Angela just said she's missing you already. Um, and are you worried not about so Jeremy Corbyn? Not so much Corbyn? today. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn, <laughs> are you worried about him standing again? No. Let's talk about this. Daily Mail. Ministers to ban schools from teaching sex education to children aged under nine, with teachers urged to tell pupils that gender ideology is a contested belief. It's the story that the government has finally published draft guidelines uh, and guidance on sex education in England schools today. As you see there, uh, it's banning the teaching of sex education to children under nine. Let's have a listen to the Education Secretary, Gillian Keegan. On teaching about gender reassignment, many schools have told us that they need clear guidance to help them teach about this highly sensitive, complex issue in a factual and safe way. We are making it absolutely clear that the contested topic of gender identity should not be taught in schools at any age. Schools should not be providing classroom materials that, for example, include the view that gender is a spectrum. Whilst protected characteristics such as gender reassignment should be taught, they must be done so on a factual basis at an appropriate age and not based on contested ideology. Well, I asked the BBC's education correspondent, Elaine Dunkley, what that means. Well, this is a relatively new area for teachers to, to, to have to deal with, and the guidance today strongly states that lessons about gender identity will be banned. It says that the idea that children can adopt different pronouns and the concept that someone's gender may be different to their biological sex is highly contested, and teachers should stick to teaching facts about biological sex. This is a very tricky area, and the guidance suggests that the teaching of gender identity is leading to confusion amongst some teachers, to, amongst some pupils. And so the government has said that it shouldn't be taught as a theory that is discussed, it should only be taught in terms of facts. The Education Secretary, Gillian Keegan, says that she has seen evidence herself, examples, that children in primary school have been taught things about multiple genders, and it's leading to children being confused. Now, the government says, in light of the CAS review, it's important that schools take a cautious approach to teaching about this sensitive topic and do not use any materials that present contested views as fact, including the view, the view that gender is a spectrum. And this is in line with the Department for Education's gender questioning guidance, which also takes a cautious approach. Now, teachers have asked for clarity on this issue, but just because this guidance has been issued, it doesn't mean that those children who may have struggles around their identity are suddenly going to disappear. And so teachers are asking, well, what should we do when a child wants to discuss these issues and what consequences will there be for teachers if they do discuss these issues? Well, that was uh, Elaine uh, Dunkley, my colleague, and Gillian Keegan speaking in the Commons, I think, a short while ago. James, first of all, why was this guidance necessary? I think the evidence is very clear that the kids themselves are deeply confused. The Children's Commissioner report spoke to 320,000 children and their degree of mental health challenges and genuine confusion amongst pupils about these kinds of issues, about particularly sex education, is really profound. It also spoke about mobile phones, access to pornography, mm. and the whole um, <laughs> turmoil that young kids face nowadays uh, in talking uh, about sex. These are conversations that should really be having with parents at a young age, not, not uh, solely in school. So I think these are very sensible measures and parents will be very relieved to hear them. Do you, do you welcome them? No sex well, education under the age of nine? I'm not no, sure there was that much no, sex I, education I, going to kids on time. But anyway. I, I don't think there was. OK. Um, but, uh, I mean, the first thing to say is we have to look at what's happening here in the process. The government have been going to come up with these guidelines 
for months, months and months. Yeah. They've left no support okay. or guidance for teachers. Mm. And what happens, two days ago, they are spun to all the right-wing papers. So we've had two days of well, ridiculous headlines. let's talk about the substance. No but, no, but you have to look at what's going on here. People are being used as evidence. pawns in the culture war. Okay. So it could have been done better. It's been I a great think the important thing, exercise. I think the important thing, well, I wish that they'd have... I haven't seen it's the guidelines. Published. No, it's been published while we've been on air. No, the I tried. Has been I tried to get the guidelines. Haven't been published. I haven't been able to read them before coming on here. So I can only rely on various bits of spin. The key thing, though, is it's I'm got done. to be age appropriate. Um, it's got to be thinking about having the child and the interests of the child at heart. Uh, it's important, despite all of the uh, the moral panic about trans people that we acknowledge that trans people exist and they have rights mm. uh, in law and they have the right to be treated with respect and dignity. Yeah. That's an important part as well. Well, can I just that, pick up on that? Yeah. Uh, on that with uh, yeah. Lucy and Owen. Yeah. Because this phrase, the, the guidance makes clear that the concept of gender identity, what, what? you've been saying, the sense of a person may have of their own gender, whether male, female, or a number of other categories, is highly contested mm -hmm. and shouldn't be taught. Yeah. What do you think that means? I mean, Angela has just said it's recognised in law, and now we have guidance saying it's highly contested. But it is highly contested. I mean, uh, the NHS has also brought out their own guidance on this about, you know, dividing into, you know, genders and sex in their, in their own departments. So the idea that it isn't contested is not true. The very fact we're even debating it now says it's contested. And I think I'm really surprised that it's got to this point because in schools, um, teachers should not be imposing their own personal beliefs and their own no ideas onto are. children. And these are political beliefs because no they are contested. They are. And if it is contested, then this is but a political belief. It is, it, is a, it, is a it is a fact that trans people exist. That it is, is a true. fact that people that change true, and transition that's not a in terms of their belief. gender identity. It's, but and by, the, the, well, let Owen finish, I'll come back. When, look, look I, I, I grew up into Section 28. I was a closeted gay teenager. And so just say, yeah, and just say that Clause Section 28, 28 what, what it did is it prohibited the promotion of homosexuality by local authorities. In practice, that meant there was no teaching on LGBTQ yeah. education whatsoever. Margaret Thatcher introduced that saying that t children are being taught they have an inalienable right to be gay. That's what she said. And there was this idea of contagion, that by being taught about gay people existing, that would turn children we'd, we'd gay. Multiply. Now, what that actually meant in practice, growing up, yeah. if you grow up LGBTQ when you're young, it is terrifying. And if you don't have education, something else fills the vacuum. You hear what other people say. Now, that might be other people being supportive, but it might be other people saying very ignorant things. And do you think the this is the same moment for, for, for Absolutely, and the other thing that really worries me, when Cammy Badenoch, she says it really angered me, what she said was, yeah, in, in support of the idea if someone changes their gender presentation, then their parents have to be told. She said because nobody loves their children more than their parents. Now, in some cases, that's true. But that's not true in some cases. Some parents are abusers, and in, my, in, in terms of LGBTQ I people, just, all LGBTQ people know. Just quickly, all LGBTQ people know. All LGBTQ people know. Par uh, lives of their friends who've been ruined by their parents because they failed to accept All right. it. Well, I'm really respond. sorry, but, you know, children are not the property of the state. You do not get a right as the state to come in and intervene between a child and a parent relationship in this Even way. Even if they're abusive? But that, we're not abusive. talking about a very yes, specific are. instance. You yeah, are. No, I'm not. Make, make I'm make talking generally about this topic. I'm saying that you cannot go into a parent-child relationship and take the power away from a parent and decide on their behalf. It isn't. It's completely inappropriate. And I think we have to start putting up barriers as to what teachers can and cannot say to our children. As a young woman who has grown up in, into, into a state school system, I also know what it's like having to deal with my identity as a woman. And I think we should be protecting women. And that is precisely what I think this government is trying to do. No, 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 again, what we're talking about here, I don't, no one's no, saying what that... You're talking no, no, about nobody's saying, hold on, about hold on, hold on, hold on. Nobody's saying that parents shouldn't have a role and the state will mm -hmm. take over. We're saying that, firstly, you, you shouldn't out children to their parents without, without regardless of the circumstances. I'm sorry, but the parent according, is the main guardian, according, the teacher right, is okay, not. You, they we, are the, they are the person who... Don't, 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 don't talk over each other, it's that very Many LGBTQ people grow up with parents who are homophobic, anti-LGBTQ, and that has a lifelong damaging consequence for them. Do you accept that or not? That's a straightforward My, question. No, the point is here, and it's not what, you've, what you're setting out here. It's about Are who you gets the question? ultimate say. 
Is it the parent or is it the state? But that is the question. Who, in the, Owen, can, we focus on, can we focus on what is being proposed right. in this guidance well, and whether it is fair to trans people? Because there's been a, there's been a change in tone, let me put it that way, uh, as well as language. Uh, and actually, the Clause 28 moment, um, Peter Carl, the uh, Labour MP, also said he was growing up as a gay man when that was in place, and he said he felt that the government was against mm. him yes. at that time. And we didn't get the chance to ask him yesterday, how would he feel? But we've got um, Owen here to say the same. How does it feel for trans people? You think it will have the same sort of, of course, impact? Why is it I mean, I, to be honest, I, I think that the, the hostility towards trans people that there's been in the debate recently has increased the number of um, hate-filled attacks that trans people yeah. have faced. And by the way, there's been a big increase in attacks on LGBT people yeah. in general. Uh, they face that on the street. And if you think that the government doesn't understand uh, the way you are and is ridiculing you, which some members of the government well, have been doing, then that is very, very difficult. But that is not what this right. should be about. No. This is about teaching sex and relationship education at an appropriate, age appropriate level in our schools to support all children, regardless of whether they're growing up LGBT uh, or, or not, yep. making certain that they can adjust to life as it is, to deal with some of the dangers online that, that Lord Bethel has been talking about, and understanding right. that if they're not given proper information at school, they will get it from somewhere exactly. else. Right. Okay. There are but now there's a different... large percentages let me, let Jane, of girls let who think the they should be hit let, by their boyfriends. Let, exactly. let James... Let James. Let no, James well, respond. I think. That, uh, listen, I agree. I agree. With, you put that very well. Um, but the decision about when it is appropriate it should be made by the parent, not by the school. Well, and that is a fundamental th right of parents. Well, I think the and guidance the cash has review, got some view on that. The cash that. review oh. gave some very, very vivid examples of where schools had. Got spun out of control, and well, that's I don't because think of it, the I think these are. I think these are edge cases, and I'm not saying that the, that the whole system is, is is wrong. Most schools are doing a, a really great job, but they, the schools themselves have asked for clarity. Parents are very clear that they're unhappy, and the kids. Oh, we, we, we have to hold, hold on, hold on, Owen. Hold on, Owen. Wait a Owen enough. Hang we've on. we've had on. we've had um, a you. very very clear signal from the children themselves that they are not happy with being bombarded with sexual imagery online, with being taken too quickly exactly. through the education. I don't think anyone would disagree with right. that. It's got to be age yeah. appropriate. But do you accept yeah. no, that I, the I debate they, I, do you accept that, that the debate has changed within Labour? We're streeting. Uh, a gay man, Shadow Health Secretary, saying that once he saw the CAS review, the Hillary CAS review into NHS gender care, and she brought up all sorts of grievances and problems, said it had been under research, he changed his mind in terms of his approach. Um, and I, I mean, I, I think that the CAS review and, and, and the issue about gender clinics is a completely different thing that you shouldn't connect. You shouldn't connect up. To this, yes. um, that's, the, the, first yes, that's the first thing to say. That's the first thing to say. Except that he said that people like himself, leading figures, were part of the decades-long problem of silencing any critic of the sweeping transgender debate. He said absolutely, and he said now that he blew all of that out of proportion. He's changed well, his view yeah, when it comes to discussion. Well, we're treating is completely unrepresentative of control of, of where LGBTQ people stand on this. Look, the, the point is. Well, that at the moment, if you are a trans <laughs> child, you live in a society where your government is constantly whipping up bile for cultural reasons, where the media is portraying, just as gay people were portrayed, sexual predators, mentally ill, threats to children. The same songs are being sung that has a very damaging impact. And we now, I'm sorry to hear on national television saying that in all circumstances, parents should have the final say, when there are parents in this country right, who think being that. gay is evil. All right, but we I want mean, to talk ludicrous. about the impact of this guidance. Mm -hmm. Why, listening to everything you've heard, yeah. why do you think it needs to change? So quite dramatically. I think there's a vulnerability yeah, of children and they're very impressionable. Um, I think that there are teachers who have very specific opinions and very strong opinions like Owen um, who want to uh, who want to sort of prescribe their own personal opinions and I think that's wrong. I All think right. they should be developing and having a childhood. We didn't even have time for immigration. That just shows you what the <laughs> panel was like in a good way. Um, I'll be back next week. Bye.